Boom Supersonic, a startup supersonic aircraft manufacturer, burst onto the scene in 2014 and has continued to gain more and more recognition as time passes. Boom's activities are centered around the construction of the Overture, a 65 to 88 seat passenger airliner. Picking up where the Concorde left off, the firm has championed itself as the leader in future supersonic transport. Let's look at the business model of operating a supersonic passenger aircraft in today's video. In June 2021, the manufacturer made headlines when United Airlines announced a commitment to purchase 15 units of the Overture. A little over a year later, in August 2022, Boom again made waves when American Airlines placed an order for 20 examples of the same airframe. With two major US airlines committed to adding the Overture to their fleet, the aircraft will more than likely enter the skies before the end of the current decade if it can pass all regulatory hurdles and demonstrate safe and reliable operation. But we have to ask ourselves, what has Boom done to mitigate the most common profitability issues in supersonic flying? In other words, how will airlines completely fill their overtures in order to turn a considerable profit? Boom has been very clear that the aircraft will be targeted at business travelers, and all the company's mock-up images demonstrate a premium product in line with the nicest domestic first-class offerings. On the surface, this makes quite a lot of sense. Business travelers pay the highest prices for their tickets and would be most concerned about time. However, this business model does pose a few unique challenges that Boom's operators will have to overcome. Let's examine a fairly straightforward case study. Say a New York-based consultant needs to be in London from Tuesday to Friday to visit a client. Currently, the consultant would likely take a flight such as British Airways Flight 176, departing from New York JFK at 7.35 p.m. and arrive at London Heathrow shortly after 7 a.m. With modern business class offerings featuring a lie-flat bed, this flight wouldn't damage the employee's productivity. They could receive nearly a full night's sleep on the seven-and-a-half-hour transatlantic flight, waking up in the morning of their destination. When returning from London, the consultant might take British Airways Flight 179, which would leave London at 6 p.m. and arrive in New York shortly after 9 p.m. By taking this conventional subsonic itinerary, the consultant is able to spend the entire day working at their Manhattan office on Monday, get a complete rest on the plane that night, and productively work in London all of Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday before flying home Friday evening just in time for the weekend. Let's now imagine Boom's three-and-a-half-hour transatlantic supersonic flights. Now, if our consultant were to fly to London on Monday evening, they would either have to depart much further into the evening or arrive significantly earlier in the morning. In either scenario, the traveler will be unable to achieve a whole night's sleep, if any at all, on this supersonic transatlantic journey, particularly in Boom's recliner seats. This will likely have a significant effect on our individual's Tuesday productivity, which could cause diminished performance throughout the rest of the week. When returning from London on Friday, the traveler will be able to arrive back in New York significantly earlier than they would on a subsonic service. However, this is not of major concern to the passenger's employer, as a few extra hours off on a Friday night shouldn't be an issue. Daytime flights would not work for Boom for the same reason conventional transatlantic flights do not meet the needs of business travelers. Even if our consultant did work during the duration of his flight from New York to London, he would only complete three and a half hours worth of work while his employer would be paying for eight and a half due to the time difference. With these two options compared side by side, it becomes clear that most firms would prefer subsonic transport for their employees on such a transatlantic route. So, as you can see, Boom airline customers will need to address the key issues that quicker journey times bring for business travelers, who likely play a critical role in Overture's potential profitability. 
While the logistics may prove more optimal for Trans-Pacific flights or other long-haul overwater routes, the aircraft only has a range of 4,250 nautical miles, preventing it from servicing even the most traditional Pacific routes such as Los Angeles to Tokyo, a distance of 5,500 nautical miles. Boom's website states affirmatively that there are, quote, over 600 profitable routes that the Overture could serve. However, the more deeply one scrutinizes the jet's target market and range, the more difficult it is to identify this potential. Bizarrely, one of these quote-unquote profitable routes that Boom suggests connects Seoul, South Korea and San Francisco, California, two cities that lie nearly 4,900 nautical miles apart, a distance beyond the range the company advertises for the jet. At the end of the day, it is essential to remember that Concorde, the aircraft that is our only reliable case study in supersonic aviation, did actually manage to turn a profit for its operators. Outside of crisis times, Concorde operators British Airways and Air France were able to turn a consistent year-after-year -year profit flying the supersonic jet. However, during much of Concorde's existence, subsonic jets did not usually have lie-flat seats in business class. This made supersonic transport more appealing to the business traveller. Perhaps precedent is not the right thing to look at here, as the world has so drastically changed since the COVID-19 pandemic, with business travel specifically experiencing massive change. High net worth individuals, however, may ultimately end up proving Boom's saving grace. In a world where carbon footprints are increasingly more important, private jets have increasingly come under scrutiny. Governments could eventually place severe restrictions on private aviation in the future. Thus, if the private option is removed, many of the wealthiest travelers could choose to fly Boom's Overture. Indeed, this would be a demographic that could help the supersonic jet become profitable. Furthermore, a culture of elite travelers could give the Overture an aura of prestige, further increasing ticket prices and load factors. Regardless of Overture's future profitability, Boom's order book already demonstrates that many believe they can succeed with supersonic travel by the late 2020s. What do you think of Boom's current situation? How do you think airlines might schedule transatlantic services to make them appealing to their passengers? Share your thoughts by leaving a comment below. Simple Flying publishes over 150 articles every week. If you're looking for the latest aviation news and insights, visit simpleflying.com.